Kim, don't get nervous. It'd be a little bit. I'm just giving them time to find it. I've been pastoring them a long time. I know it takes them a while. You good there, Paul? Appreciate you, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Man, he's loaded down. I uh, I learned years ago as a pastor to be careful with my expectations. First off, as a husband, as a father of five, and my expectations of my children, uh, I've, I've observed things of, as a pastor of church, because I've lived when things were super exciting, so there was always this over-expectations of things. And we're moving into 20... 24 and next week i will talk to you a little bit about fasting for particularly for those of you that have never done it matter of fact i started fasting even this week me and my daughter katie started fasting and sharing the word of god with each other for a couple of days and uh, just getting a start in, in controlling uh, i like intermittent fasting my son judah does it all the time he's gone from about 230 down to 180 but he, he's the thing is about health it's not about losing weight you just want to be healthy so as I walk toward this year, I think about, okay, Lord, what am I going to do? Because oftentimes you guys, all of us, will will set an agenda for the year. And within two weeks, we realize that was stupid. You know, that was dumb, you know. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the tyranny of over-expectations. And I want you to write down what's in the green. Over-expectations lead to frustration. Say it with me. Over-expectations lead to frustration. One more time. Over-expectations lead to frustration. I started golfing again about three months ago because of Pastor Joseph. And uh, it's been 20 years since I've golfed, Leon, and I was fair back in the day, H. We played a lot. And I over-expected. I thought, well, I, this ain't nothing. And we went out and uh, played this week, and I was with a young man. A, a father-in-law said to me, his, this young man's father-in-law said, I want you to take my son-in-law out and talk to him, you know, deal with him. I said, all right. I, I invited him out. Like the guy, the father-in-law, man, he needs to get stuff together because this is a good dude. <laughs> and uh, he was hitting a golf ball off the tee 280 yards. I'm about 180. But watching him a couple of holes, I thought, well, shoot, I can do that. <laughs> Man, I reared back and I hit that ball as hard as I could. It didn't go far. I didn't hit it as hard as I could. I missed it. And, uh, and my hamstring pulled. <laughs> and, and, I mean, it felt like somebody shot me in the back end in the buttocks. <laughs> and, uh, and I was walking awkwardly. As a matter of fact, I just became the chauffeur. I just drove the guy around. But had I been just, you know, golfing with, with Pastor Joseph and the guys I go with, I'd have been all right. But watching him hit that ball that far just made me want to go, I can do it. I'm, I can do it. I can't. As a matter of fact, after that, I couldn't even hit a wedge. I mean, it was over. I was, I was putting in pain, you know. So uh, I, I learned real quickly. So I thought, what am I going to preach this week? And there it is. The tyranny. It's tyranny, man. You, you know, at certain ages, you've got certain expectations of yourself, and you've got to learn how to live in your seasons. Can I get an amen? Amen. And for in my life, I, I've, I've got, you got to be careful because we go from one extreme to the other, and, and I've always been seeking balance in an unbalanced world, and there are few healthy people that enjoy mediocrity. I don't like just being... Uh, in neutral all the time. Life has got to have challenges. We've got to take risks. We've got to press on. And it seems as each year passes, we begin to expect more of this year than last year. And I'm going to tell you, eventually that breaks down because we as, a, you know, we even do it with our kids. We we think, well, I want more for them than I had for myself. That may That's going to break down eventually because of our economy. It just happens that way. And of course, if you've got more than one child, always the last one gets more than the first one. You notice that? And the oldest one will tell you that. 
So don't get me wrong. I'm going to push to make this year better where last year was lacking. But the memories and the laughter of my yesteryears are fuel for my emotions. And I'm just believing God that as we move into this next year that perhaps we get a little better, that things get uh, a little more exciting. There'll be more opportunities to make great memories. But the over-expector, there are, and I will use that word, and, and even when I type that word, my, my, uh, my computer underlined it and said, that ain't a word. Because I put them together, I see that my wife put a little hyphen there, but it's one word to me, over-expectors, people who expect too much from you. And you'll hear them say, there's always room for improvement. There's an, there's an area or two that isn't quite up to snuff. It's always something to criticize, always. The over-expector uses words like you should, you ought, love sentences that include must and more. And when you're around an over-expector, you get the distinct impression that no matter how hard you've tried, you haven't measured up. And worse, you never will. Some people are married to over-expectors. Some people have parents who are over-expectors. Some, there are pastors who are over-expectors. Over-expectors don't say that, but, they, but the meaning oozes out of their frowns and their glares when they look at you. And sooner or later, your motivation is sapped as demands and expectations replace excitement with guilt and shame. The killer is when you realize you have become a weary slave of the impossible, somebody else's expectations. Fun fades Laughter leaves, and what remains is the tyranny of the urgent, the uptight, the essential, the expected, always the expected, which being interpreted means if I keep trying this, I'll have a heart attack. I, I was a, uh, I've coached soccer. I've coached basketball. I've often pushed kids to, but you've got to find out where they're at. Uh, Terry, I remember years ago I had a, Toby Cochran and Tony Cochran and Tommy Cochran. And, and, uh, and I, had a, I had a basketball team over in Channel View, Tommy. And we played against a, a, a group over in Wood Forest Baptist Church. I almost got in a fight with the youth pastor there. I was such a, uh, an, not an instigator, but a passionate guy about ball. I had two ball teams. And, and on Saturday morning, we would play basketball against all the local ba uh, churches, which were normally Baptist churches. And uh, I would have to sober my guys <laughs> I had such a youth group. Oh, my goodness. They'd be out on Friday night, and they'd show up, and they'd be sweating. Why are you sweating? Because they were drunk the whole night before. And you may laugh about that, but I love these guys, and I was reaching for them, and, and I was using basketball as a hook to get them to play. And, and we had so much fun. But I, I realized in their lives that some could do this and some couldn't. I coached the teams that, uh, in, in, in uh, junior high. I had an undefeated junior high team. The only team beat us was a high school team. We'd score 70, 80 points as a junior high team. I knew how to coach ball. I knew how to motivate them. But to over-expect from somebody that can't do it, for somebody who's struggling with it, to just give them a little encouraging in life is such an important thing. And as believers in Christ, sometimes you want to be that super saint. You want to be that one that's, that's got, maybe somebody's pushing you in that area. You know, I look at our band this morning. I walked in and first thing Josiah told me was, we don't have a drummer. And you know what? I've just learned to calm down. I don't panic. I try to calm them down. Don't panic. Listen, this church is here to worship. They're going to worship. I know that bunch out there. They're going, to, they're going to love God if it's just up here with a tambourine beating it. Sister Susie on a tambourine. Amen. And I've, I've had great big bands and small bands. Either way, we're going to worship God. Can I get an amen? Amen. So what happens when we don't tell over expectors that's enough? Amen. A little child loses his love for art because he's told time and time again to stop coloring outside of the lines. Parents can be over expectors. A spouse's joy erodes in the marriage because of over expectancy. You're not 20 years old anymore. You're not 40 years old anymore. So you're not 60 years old anymore. You know, back in the day when you were in, married, maybe in your 20s, things were different. Now you're older. You can't expect everything like you did before. She doesn't bring you the remote as quick as she did. A high school athlete chooses to hang it up at midseason because he knows he'll never measure up. Coaches can be over expectors. And yes, congregations get tired of being beaten and bruised and with jabs and hooks and brow beaten with uppercuts from pulpits. Preachers can be over expectors and try to force people. Yeah, you know, I want to see us. I, this is all I, all I ask for in our church is to, to uh, worship, worship because he's worthy of our worship, and reach. 
reach people. People need Jesus. Your neighbor needs Jesus. Schools need Jesus. Employees, employers need Jesus. Amen. You're, you're, the people you play ball with need Jesus. Amen. So I'm not telling you to just settle. Go for the next level. The Bible calls it line upon line. Precept upon precept, from glory to glory. That's how life is. But it's hard to go from, from line to glory. You got, you, this is how we do it. You'll often hear me use phrases like one domino at a time. Amen. Life is about moving in, in increments and moving up. And if you can do that in life, it, next thing you know, within one year, your life is going to be so much better. Can I get an amen? Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary. And burdened. You're carrying a burden. The burden's probably not for you. It's for a family member, a friend, someone you love, perhaps uh, someone far away or a group of people, but you're burdened for them. You feel for them. It's more than empathy. It's sympathy. You, you tear up when you think about them. When I mentioned I've been to Africa, I know about the people there, and my heart broke when I read about Christians. I re, I, my heart broke when I read about ISIS going and marking buildings where Christians lived so they could be annihilated. Just because you have a belief in God, a love for Jesus, amen. How, so I, I have a burden for that. So it's one reason I support my daughter who's going, you know, and I know she's reaching Muslims. Muslims need to be reached because if they're not reached, they won't change. Amen. It has to be a change there. So Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Sometimes when you read the Bible, you'll read the word yoke, and you say, what in the world is a yoke? See, I, I come from a tiller generation. Didn't have a tractor. We had a tiller. And you got behind the tiller, and, you, and it tilled the ground, and you, we had a garden. My dad would put a, a, a little thing down at the end. A little, that, this is going to be a roll of peas, and he'd put a little marker. He'd keep your eye on that. Don't take your eye off that. If you take your eye off that, you're going to end up in the corn row. Amen. Stay in the pea row. Amen. So we'd pea row down through there, and then I'd turn and come back down to corn row. But before there was tillers, there were uh, oxen. And the oxen had yokes, and they were double yokes. You had a yoke on this end, a yoke on this end, and you put it on it. Now, there is a way to do it when you've got a large oxen and a weak oxen. You put the tiller and you set it in such a way, you shorten it where the, the big oxen is carrying all the weight and the little oxen is just there for the ride. You follow where I'm going? So Jesus has harnessed himself to the short yoke, amen, so he can carry the load and all we are along for the ride. That's why he said, hit your wagon to me. Everybody follow the preacher now? Amen, that's what he's talking about here. And he said, for I'm gentle, I'm, I'm gentle. I'm, I'm not an over-expector of you. I do expect something from you, but I'm not an over-expector of you. I'm gentle, and I'm humble in heart. You're going to find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, that, that something we carry, amen, is always used metaphorically. It just is telling me that I, that I feel something on the inside is pressing on me. What he doesn't say, what Jesus doesn't say here is, come on, why are you weary? Why are you wore out? Why are you tired all the time? Amen. Take some Geritol. You young people ain't got no idea. You need rest. I ain't helping you. Jesus didn't say that. What he says here is you're going to enter into my rest. Now, Christ's rest is not a rest from work, but in work. God never called us to quit working. As a matter of fact, the answer to boredom is work. I say it over and over. It's the answer to boredom. 
do something. Go to work. Amen. It's not the rest of inactivity, but the harmonious working of all the faculties and affections of will, heart, imagination, conscience, because each has found in God the idea sphere and its satisfaction of development is harmony. When I work with Jesus, I find out it's harmony. It just works together. It's like a good band. Everything's working together. Not one's overdoing the other. Everything's working in harmony. My spirit, my soul, my body, everything's there. So when I get with him and he's carrying the load, I find a place in God. Things are working together. Now, they're all through Scripture. There's over-expectations of the Pharisees. They put impossible task on people. Matthew 23, 1, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, that was the local preachers, sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Woe unto any pastor that tells you to worship and they don't worship. Woe to any pastor that tells you to reach people and they don't reach people. Amen. I'm about worship. I'm about reaching. I'm about giving and fasting and praying. I'm not going to tell you to do something I don't do. But he said the Pharisees did it all the time. They would tell you how to live. They'd tell you not to carry things on the Sabbath. They would tell you different things about the yoke, and they would take the Scriptures and use it against you. And they're still doing it. They're still doing it over in the Middle East, telling people how to live. Amen. And yet they're not practicing it themselves. Luke eleven forty five. 45. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, talking to Jesus, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us. You hurt our feelings. I love Jesus. He didn't go, oh, I'm sorry. Did that hurt your feelings? Did that lick the red off your sucker? Did that slay your dragon? Did that knock the apples off your cart? I apologize. No. He said to them, when they said, you insult us, he said, and you experts in the law, woe to you. Because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Overexpector. All of us overachievers need big doses of Jesus' counsel. Now that we've discussed overexpectation, let's talk a little bit about this new year coming up. Habits. Woo! Line upon line. See, life, we battle personal embarrassment to physical limitations. You know, I'd hurt this hammy out, you know, and I did that wedding, and I, honest, Kenny, I prayed. I, I mean, I ain't lying. I talked to Jesus all the way from the time I left that building until I got to that area where I was going to do that, fun that wedding. I almost called it a funeral. Uh, that wedding. And, and I walked, and I was careful. I, I worked that ham. Boy, I, I was like, it right here. Amen. I was careful because I was battling with this personal embarrassment. I didn't want to trip in front of anybody. The cameras were on me. They had me set up for a camera. They had me set up for a mic. Everything was looking at the preacher. And, boy, I was like a robot walking out there. I didn't want to embarrass, because we all do that. We all get in this place, it's just a little bit embarrassing, you know. And, uh, and, but when it was all over, my wife and I were walking away, and I tripped and stumbled carrying plates of food and tea. I just chunked the tea, caught myself on this side of the leg, and screamed like a baby. <laughs> Can I tell the truth and shame the devil? Sicknesses we didn't ask for. We all go through it. Habits, some accepted, some not, some lawful, some lawless. That's the price we pay for being human. We have accepted habits. We all do. We just kind of accept them with people. We know that our sister is a gossip. We just accept it. We know that our brother has anger issues. We just accept it. Amen. But I think this year we can deal with some of that. We have accepted habits of overeating, exaggerating, procrastinating. Some of us by habit are negative, suspicious, paranoid, resulting in habitual closed-minded responses, habitually ungrateful, demanding, over-expecting. Some feel trapped by overt dependence on alcohol, addiction to drugs, and, and lure of sensual lust or appeal for every ill, habits like gossip, worry, irritability, profanity, practice without, and here's the thing, practice without guilt. 
We practice it without guilt. We're not even, we don't even feel guilty about profanity. We say words that should not exit our mouth. When, when I, was, I was out golfing a couple of weeks ago, and, and was, it's just me and one other guy, and we joined up with another guy, and another two guys, and the guy's mouth was filthy. And so the guy that was with me said, Pastor, you want me to tell him? I said, no, there's no need of it. No, no let, me, let me just play along a little while, and then we'll catch him. Amen. So they don't need to know I'm a preacher. Hallelujah. So right after a couple of hosts, I looked over at my friend and Jesse, and I said, Jesse, you know, the cop pulled me over. And now these guys are into it because the cop pulled me over. And I said, and he looked over and he saw my, my gun in, in my console, and I knew he saw my gun. And I said, when I, uh, when I opened it up and pulled it out, the, the hoster said, Pastor, it was amazing the difference that one word made. <laughs> For the rest of the time, it was as if Jesus showed up and walked with these guys everywhere we went. I heard, oh, shoots, and gosh, and darn, and all kind of words like that. Amen. It just like they, they couldn't even say anything that was negative again. I thought, what? Well, just one word, pastor, and it affected them like that. I wasn't trying to change it, but it's amazing. When, you know, we, we do things without, we just say it. Stop it. You don't need to curse like that. There's certain words that I know that aren't acceptable in Texas, but I'm telling you, there are certain words that aren't, and you shouldn't be saying them. You should never ask God to curse something, ever. Amen. That, that, that's it was funny. The guy said GD once, and my friend said, yeah, he just cursed that drive all right. Amen. Everything that guy did from then on went, Poof. it's like when he saw the word pastor, his game went to H-E double toothpicks. <laughs> We need the help of God. Amen? It's your problem. You deal with it. If you are expecting more this year, then go after it. But stop rationalizing. Oh, that's just me. I'm just like that. My dad cursed, I curse. My mama was angry, I get angry. This Grandma was unforgiving, I'm unforgiving. Quit that. Or quit saying nobody's perfect. Such excuses take the edge off of disobedience and encourage you to ignore the Spirit of God. Apply a strategy. Get a strategy. And I often use people to help me with my strategy. You know, I, accountability with that. And, and use a rifle, not a shotgun. And when I say that, in other words, just pinpoint it. Don't just try to, you know, this year I'm going to quit cussing, quit drinking, going to quit this, going to quit that. I, I'm going to get my health right. Everything's going to be right. I'm going to fast three days a week. I'm going to, no! You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to make everybody mad around you. You're going to eat, need to eat a Snickers. <laughs> Pull it. Decide. Okay, I just first I'm going to watch my mouth. Don't tell me you say it without thinking. Because you know you thought it before you said it. So watch your tongue. The Bible says put a guard on your tongue. And watch that. What, what, what about other habits? You, you decide what it is you're going to deal with this year. If it's in the area of entertainment, what is it you want to watch? What is it you're not going to watch? Be realistic. It won't happen fast. It won't be easy, nor will your resolve become permanent overnight. Periodic failures are still better than habitual slavery. slavery. Let me say it again. Periodic failures are still better than habitual slavery. I, I've, I've lost 30 pounds since June. June. July. August, September, October, November, December, 30 pounds. It wasn't overnight. I was this, 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 working up and down, back and forth. But the issue is I got to get the weight off for my legs. I ain't trying to look pretty for y'all. Them years are over. <laughs> but I got to get the weight off, H, so I can keep moving and, and keep, because I got to run with these young bucks in the church, so I got to keep, got to stay healthier so I can do that. But it takes time. And then don't fall in love with your scales. I, I don't get on the scale every morning. I'll look at that scale and say, uh uh, not today, devil. <laughs> I'll get on you when I feel light. <laughs> and I sure don't get on you at night. <laughs> and then be encouraged. Amen. Enthusiasm, strength, and self discipline, and prompts an attitude of stick to this. Hang out with encouraging people. People that encourage you to keep praying and fasting and giving and loving and, and forgiving and going on. And start today. 
Amen. Start today. Just start today. Just do little things today. But on November, uh, January the 9th, we start fasting. Now you say, Pastor, that's not a Sunday. I know. But we're going to pray about it on next Sunday. We're going to anoint ourselves all next Sunday. But then that Monday, there's football. You see what I'm doing here? I'm not overexpected. Now, you don't watch football. You start fasting on Monday. But I ain't going to start till Tuesday. I'm going to tell you the truth now. I ain't, I'm not going to I've done this before. I'm just going, I'm going to skip a day, and I'll start. And I can take from the 9th to the 31st of January and fast the rest of that month. Now, I won't take every day off from food, but I'll take off from, from a lot of, I'll take food off from several days. And I'll take, I'll probably take a, a caffeine off. And I'll, I'll take different things off out of my, my, my life. You stop drinking sodas and think, just decide what you want to do. But I, ain't, I don't do just because what the preacher's doing. Find out what it is you'd like to do. And then say, God, and then put the Word of God in your life. Read more. Memorize more. Get into things. Take Proverbs. There's 31 chapters. Take a chapter a day. Go through it. Go through in different translations. Uh, Katie and I were going through it, and we were laughing about it. As the, as the sloth hinges on, 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 on the bed, you know, he just hinges to it. He's stuck to it. He don't want to get out of bed. And, you know, that's like hitting the alarm clock. And she said, this is a funny scripture. And I said, look at chapter 27 of Proverbs, verse 15, 16. I won't say nothing about that. And she said, you better not. It says that, that a woman's nagging is like a drip, drip, drip. She said, you better not say nothing about that. I said, I just I hadn't let you know that's in there too. <laughs> you see what I mean? You will love it. Just enjoy the Bible. Enjoy the Scripture where you're at. Uh, John, Hebrews chapter 10, I got to start closing here, uh, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood. Everybody say the blood. Well, we took communion. It's by the blood of Jesus. It's the blood plus nothing. By a new and living way opened for us through the curtain. When that curtain tore, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with the pure water. And the water is the word of God. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. And he who promised is faithful. Now catch this verse 24 and let us consider how we may spur every cowboy understands that how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds if there's any expectation we have it's love and good deeds and we keep doing this let us not give up meeting together keep coming to church keep going to the special meetings keep gathering with swap and and, and forge and all the and sis and all the groups that we've got in this house let us consider even meeting together watch out became why do we do that because of over expectations we get together and encourage one another as some are in the habit people get in the habit you can get in the habit of missing church i said you can get in the habit of missing church if you miss church three weeks you just started a habit if you come to church for three weeks you just started a habit it takes three weeks to form a habit three weeks to break a habit if I don't see you for three weeks, I'm going to have somebody get you. <laughs> there are people watching me now thinking. <laughs> some are in the habit of doing, and let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Every day is another day closer. Now take these thoughts and ponder them. Chew on them. Ruminate on them balance your life you can defeat old habits and you can stop over expecting from those who keep expecting more of you this year i want you to quit this year i want you to quit i want you to quit arguing with people about their same old foolishness <laughs> last night i said something and my daughter, Katie, said, hold on. I want to write that down. She said, because well, she's asked me, what do you do about people that won't listen? I said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You keep arguing with just the wall. Let God change them. Let him put them in a fix to fix them. And you just hang around till it happens. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. 
a woman convinced against her will will just keep on taking pills. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Number two, quit telling people your secrets when you know they're not going to keep them. Why are you sharing with people who are going to keep gossiping about you? Hadn't you learned yet? If you only told one person and it got out, guess where it came from? Quit telling them. Quit trying to pull people on your journey who don't want to travel with you. There are people that belong in this house. There are people that stop coming to this house. I still love them. I still text them. I still call them. But if they don't want to travel with me, then I got to let them go. I can't beg people to follow. Can I get an amen? You can't either. Quit complaining. Oh, go back. Quit complaining about things you can't and won't change. Don't let what you cannot change change you. There are times I'll see things happen. I can't change it. People come to me, can you change? That, 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 I love that father-in-law, but he wanted me to take his son-in-law out and change him. All it did was cause me a pain in the butt. <laughs> Don't let what you cannot change change you. I can't change it. I can't run. My foot's fused. I can't run. I can do a hop, but I can't run. I can do a, a quick 20-yard sprint. Not today. And that's it. The foot don't bend. So I can't let what I cannot change change me. Amen. But I can love watching somebody else run. Do gymnastics. I got some friends that do gymnastics. It just blows my mind how they do that. It just... Quit complaining or quit gossiping about other people. Minding our own business should be a full-time job. You got business. You mind yours. Quit blaming each other for things that in the big picture aren't going to matter three weeks from now. It ain't going to matter. Talk solutions, then implement them. Quit eating things you know are not good for you. If you can't, start eating smaller portions. You know, I determined to make a bag of potato chips last me two weeks. It's so hard to find a 48-pound bag. <laughs> Quit buying things when you know you can't afford them. It, you use the credit card. Don't let it use you. Stop making payments on credit cards. Pay it off every month. If you can pay it off every month, you're using them. They're not using you. Learn to use them. Quit staying in unhealthy relationships. There are people pulling you down, sucking the life out of you. Get, 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 get away from that. It is not okay for people to verbally and physically abuse you. Quit lying to yourself. It's not okay to stay. Amen. Ask them. Well, let me go on. Quit letting family members rope you into drama. Yeah, you just came out of Christmas and Thanksgiving. And now your drama. Listen, I tell people all the time, not my circus, not my monkeys. Amen. Hey, not my circus, not my monkeys. I'm not, I don't have to deal with that. Quit trying to change people. It don't work. You can't change them. They have to learn to change themselves. But you change you. You make you better. That's what's good. You know, I'm still working on this because I really see a world of possibilities for others and I try to convince them to see and, and want differently for themselves but quit cussing people out when you know that they are just being the miserable and jealous people they are let it go this is kind of a hard one but quit the job you hate if you hate a job you, you in southeast Texas there's a lot of jobs here hey amen a lot of if you don't like your job quit sweet though Quit sweet. I told someone the other day, he said, so I'm going to leave this job, get me now. Quit sweet. Write a letter. Give them a chance to let you go early because that's what they're going to do. But go ahead. Quit sweet. Don't be mean about it. Amen. You may, I always said, don't spit in the well. Someday you may have to drink from it. Maybe you may have to come back to that. 
You know, when Pastor David and Tony left, it was sweet. The whole thing was just sweet. You know, it was, there was a lot of kindness there. Somebody said, you think they'll ever come back? I don't know. But they, if you leave sweet, you can always come back. Amen. That's just the way life is. Quit, quit volunteering for things that you aren't getting any personal fulfillment from anymore. Look, if you don't like greeting at the door, don't do it. Find somebody else that does. But as far as I know, everybody likes what they do here. But in the church world, in life in general, amen, just look around. If I don't get any personal fulfillment from it, why am I doing this? Amen. I don't want to do it again. Quit listening to the naysayers. Oh, man. Quit watching the depressing news if you are going to live in the doom and gloom of it all. And I, I, I just, there are times I don't even, I just can't watch the news no more. When we had that COVID thing, I quit watching news. I was so tired of seeing the count and what's going on and how they were pumping it. It was just fear, 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 fear. Didn't want to see it no more. I wanted faith, 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 faith. Last one. Quit waiting on others to give you the answers and start finding the answers for yourself. If what you're doing isn't working, then quit it. Quit settling and start making your dreams a reality. Quit being afraid and start living your life. Amen. Create the life you want. If you want something different than what you have, then you've got to try something different. you got to quit doing what you've been doing before. That's insanity. you got to let it go. So just quit and start doing something to create an experience you want. Now listen again. Over expectations lead to frustration. As a I go to the gym and I work out and I watch people, man, they're going after it. Man, they're going after it. I go, man. That was, and I go over there and I try to pick the weight up that they're using. And I, um, <laughs> I walk away and realize, uh, you know, I, I'm not there anymore. And it's line upon line. And maybe I can't put weights on the bar yet. But nobody told me that bar was 40 pounds. <laughs> 45. But give me time. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. Amen. Let me pray for you, church. Father, I love everybody here. I know them by face, most by names. I thank you that this year we expect to move up just a little bit more. We refuse to allow people to condemn us for where we're at. I'm believing, God, for breaking of habits, pressing on into a, a better life with you. Jesus, you have adventures waiting for us. Help us to still be those risk takers and holy wild people. Bless this house in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here.